Well, here we are once again with a, a Classic Productions and our podcast of Art Matters. This is episode four. Episode four. Thanks for reminding me, Tim. Tim's sort of my right brain to help make sure I remember things here. We're all screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we're glad to be back. Um, we uh, uh, kind of had a fits and starts with this. Um, we were we started doing some podcasts a couple of months ago, but we were realizing we were trying to do them live in location, and we were picking up so much echo and background noise that uh, we've struggled with try- trying to find a place where we could do this consistently. It was neat in concept, but did not work out in reality. Well, well, you know, at least part of it didn't work out. You know, the, the guests were great. Uh, anyhow, uh, we have had a, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to come over to the Springfield Regional Arts Council. They have a film editing bay room, and uh, Leo Hamil- Leah Hamilton was nice enough to let us use this space, and so now we've got little foam all over the walls, and I think the, the acoustics should be a little bit better than some of our previous recordings. So now that we have sort of a home here at the Springfield Regional Arts Council for a recording, we should be able to be a little bit more consistent in getting at least a monthly podcast out. Well, there's also the fact that we've just gone through about, what, five months of constant productions. From, oh, that's yeah. that's a good point. No, yeah, we've been one. very, very busy. You just know. with the class act, we've had Star Trek live on stage, Buffy live on stage, uh, Miranda, which w- w- went over very well. The Turn of the Screw, Turn of the screw and very well. Our Christmas show. And our Christmas show, which went, went very, very well, by the way. Ozark Mountain Christmas. Yes, you, uh, uh, you may not know, but we did a benefit. I'm sorry you missed it, but it was a great success. A uh, dear friend of mine, Lee Wilhelm, a playwright in New York City, uh, sent me a script with several uh, one acts that all take place in the Springfield and, and Greene County, Stone County area. And we had some wonderful musical d- direction by Tim, Tim Pilot. Oh, thank you. Interspersed among the one acts. So we had some very funny outrageous and some very poignant and sweet one acts that we My did. My mom bawled through the whole last show. Oh, I bet she did. Right now, do you want to give them how much money was raised for the Ozark Food Harvest? A little drum roll yeah, here. Yeah, that's what I was getting ready for. You All right. Get ready, over ready? Here. $500. Which for us was a, a a big deal. I mean, we're not a great big company, and uh, uh, we were all very pleased, and we were very appreciative of everybody who came out, and except. Except the oh. crazy person <laughs> on the corner of Walnut and South Street on the Friday night performance of our show. You had to bring that up, didn't you? That jerk had a bullhorn <laughs> and a speaker, and he was coming through two blocks down and through two feet of brick. Well, his, I'm sure his heart was in a very Go good ahead place. Go laugh, Mike. It's, it was <laughs> aggravating. I looked at George. Oh. The during, it was right in the middle of death, Jennifer Eifert's performance. And I looked at him like, I mouth, what is that sound? Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, and uh, it was sort of this muffled voice at first, and it's progressive. It got a little louder and a little louder, and Tim runs downstairs, and I'm thinking, well, I'll follow him to see what's going on, because Tim's in the show, and he's running downstairs when he's got a scene coming up uh, in about... 20 minutes later. I think it was about 10. <laughs> Lord have mercy, man. There's a 15-minute intermission. Anyhow, as usual, Tim's making me nervous, so I said, you get upstairs and be in place for your no, no, entrance. Tell him what happened before that, because you know, there was this whole uh. deal. He is screaming. <laughs> Now, I have no problem with people expressing their religious beliefs, even on a bullhorn. I think that's one of the awesome things about this country. I truly believe in the freedom of speech. But this jerk had it cranked all the way up and then amplified through a great big speaker so that it could be heard everywhere, blocks and blocks and blocks. And he's going on and on and uh, saying some very poignant things, I assume. No, no, not poignant. (laughs) Across the board, stupid. I'm trying to... Oh, now... (laughs) When, you, when you're fair. quoting Bible scripture, fair. you can't say it's what he's when saying is stupid. Scripture, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> Anyhow, I really did try to talk to the man quite gently and quite calmly and say, is that if you'll before or after you started singing Silent Night, Holy Night at the top of your lungs? Well, uh, that was before. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope I'm sounding like I was a sane person at this time. Anyhow. No, that, you, you start feeling like the crazy person because it's like talking to a brick wall. They don't even acknowledge your presence. I just told him, I said, look, what, the, the message you're sending is wonderful. Uh, it's a nice, wonderful Christian. No, it wasn't. Well, I, again. You can't tell somebody to hate somebody and expect that to be a good I never heard during time. that sermon him telling anybody to hate anybody. You're, you're mixing... Oh, I'm mixing occurrences with yes. the same person on the same street corner, on the same box, and well, the same megaphone. Well, I would like to get to our interview with our okay, lovely yeah. people in a minute. But let's suffice it to say that I tried to, to negotiate with the person. If you'll just turn down your, your, your loudspeaker a few notches, you can still be heard 
easily half a block away, and we you still won't be interfering with our show. I said, you know, like we're trying to do a, a very, in my opinion, a, a Christian act, and we're raising money for the needy and for hungry children. And he looked at me and kind of smirked and said, I have a permit, and I called to God to preach the word. And I said, I think that's lovely. Can you just turn it down a little bit? But no. And then he uh, kept ranting and ranting, and I said, when's the rapture coming so we can start our show again? <sighs> And that helped a lot, didn't it, Tim? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that went over well. Huh? Yeah. That's when you told yeah. me to go upstairs. That's right. Uh, uh, okay, let's move on. Let's all right, move on. anyhow, uh, okay. suffice it to say, uh, even that evening, I, uh, the people were re- realizing what's going on. And as we left, they said, yes, we heard heard him, but it was such a wonderful evening. It just didn't matter at all. And uh, everybody came together, all three nights, but especially that Friday night. all came together, and we had just a, a lovely time amongst us and with the audience, and uh, that we're concerned considering that our first annual, so uh, be looking next December for the second annual Class Act Christmas show. Shall we move on to more pleasant things? Yeah, hey, I've got some announcements if that's Good, okay. I'm so glad. Here are some upcoming productions in the Springfield area. A Class Act Productions pre- presents Star Trek live on stage, coming back after our December hiatus, on January 19th. That's a Saturday night at 8 p.m., which is also my birthday, so everybody come out and see that show that night. We're and doing bring him a present. And bring me a present. I'm not going to say what to bring, but I like Almond Joys. Um, <laughs> this, is, this episode is... Nuts, right? That's what she said. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Am I going to have to edit that out? No, 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 no. no. That's the joy of life. Junk. And, uh, um, we're going to do City on the Edge of Forever, which is cons- consistently I love voted. That episode. After 46 years of Star Trek, that's voted as the best episode. Wow. Also, the same night, we have Buffy the Vampire Slayer live on stage, an episode called Consequences at 10 p.m. Now, as always, you can catch me at Pythian Castle the second Friday of every month at 8 and 10 p.m. with my monthly ghost tours. Come hear the haunted history of one of the most haunted buildings in the entire Midwest and certainly Missouri's most haunted castle. You can go to PythianCastle.com or call 865-1464 for more information. Springfield Regional Opera presents Operazzi the third Sunday of every month from 5 to 7 p.m. And that's a lot of fun here at the Creamery Arts Center. You get to hear some local talent. Uh, woodshed some material sometimes. That's kind of interesting. That's kind of cool. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you can go to uh, sp- sroleyrictheater.org. Also, and George, uh, you'll chime in on this one a little bit. Springfield Contemporary Theater has their final performance, a uh, uh, gala called VCT Rocks on January 5th. Uh, this is to commemorate the 17 years in that space that they've been doing shows at the Vandevort. So, George, you want to chime in on that? Sure, yeah. I'm, uh, uh, I hope everybody will come out for, for that, 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 that event. Um, I have a warm spot for that theater that they're going to be having to leave there at the Vandevoort uh, Center building. Uh, that was an old uh, Masonic theater uh, where they did uh, Freemason and Masonic rituals and their ceremonies there. And um, so I always, it was such a lovely little space, a, a wonderful little proscenium theater. But since they're building a, um, a hotel there, I, we assume the sleeping people wouldn't want to hear dancing choruses of, of musicals and things going on above their heads. So. Uh, they, they decided it was best to move on to another location. I think we're still waiting to make sure where that location is going to be, but I know they're looking at several several places downtown, and I'm sure they'll release that information shortly. We're all waiting uh, with bated breath to find out where some more of these wonderful shows they've always done are going to continue to be. So uh, we will keep you posted as soon as we find out. I know I don't think there's a performer in the Springfield area that doesn't have a fond memory of, of performing in that space. Well, George, let's let's move on and introduce our special guest today. Uh, I take great joy in this because not only is he a fantastic performer and, and a world-famous opera singer now, but he's also a very good friend of mine that I've known since I was a little boy. Uh, we've got Michael Spires and his wife, Tara Stafford Spires, uh, here today with us. And um, it's a different kind of podcast today, George. Usually we talk about a performance or a production coming up. What we'd like to talk about today is this is a couple that they are both pursuing careers in the arts, and we want to talk about the ups, the downs, the goods, the bads, and I'm, I'm sure the goods far outweigh the bads, uh, you know, Definitely. but you, 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 yeah. people need to know this stuff. And Mike doesn't know I'm going to do this, but um, I found a few reviews. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, know. Uh-oh. I found a few reviews, and this is about Michael Spires. Um, the first one uh, by Opera Today calls him a star ascendant. Anthony Thomasini. What kind of star? If it's a you know white or a red it's, dwarf or you know 
Yeah, you got, you're going to get stellar on us? Okay. Red giant. <laughs> exactly. He's a red giant. Anthony Tomasini of the New York Times calls him a bright-voiced, ardent tenor. The New York Times, the same gentleman from the New York Times says, the single biggest ovation of the night went to the villain, the tenor Michael Spires, who brought his bright, penetrating voice and brilliant technique to the role of Baldessari. Now, the Wall Street Journal says, Michael Spires deployed his precise, scintillating tenor with absolute confidence and abandon, and made the insinuating runs and fierce high notes into a portrait of nastiness. One fluid upward swoop in Act Two provoked an audible gasp of wow from an audience member, and he was called back to the stage for an extra bow after his mad scene. The Wall Street Journal. So, yeah, I love like, that. Uh, you, that sounds yeah. pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty epic. So, you, you've done a couple of things. Yeah, I've tried. I've tried. I like to sing. That's <laughs> That, that much is certain. Mike, you were born and raised in the Mansfield, Missouri area. Why don't you talk a little bit about that growing up in Mansfield? Yeah, definitely. Mansfield was a, an amazing uh, uh, place for me to grow up in, be, mainly because my, my parents, uh, they were both uh, music teachers. Uh, my father uh, had been my band and choir teacher, and my mother had been my drama and choir teacher throughout the years. And my family, we were known in the area, we are basically like the uh, hillbilly Von Trapps. Yeah. Well, let me break in there. Not just that. The the um, governor of Missouri in 2002 mm -hmm. uh, declared the Spires family Missouri's most musical family. Wow. Yeah, and, that, and you throw Branson in the pot, we're, in, we're among good, good crowd. <laughs> That's good stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but Mansfield has this uh, tradition because of um, our most famous uh, person uh, was Laura Ingalls Wilder, who was a very famous writer and uh, everywhere we go around the world, it's, it's funny because I say I grew up in Mansfield, Missouri. And uh, there was this lady named uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder who wrote Little House on the Prairie. My wife loved those books. Everyone, everyone knows of that. And literally, I mean, and I'll, I'll get into a conversation in, in German or Italian and French, and I know all of the, the translations in it. So I'll be talking to someone, and uh, in German it's a Das kleines Farm. And they're like, oh, of course, yes, I know exactly uh, Das kleines Farm. And in French it's La, la Petite Maison de la Prairie. And uh, Italian it's uh, Il uh, Piccola Casa della Pradilla. And it's just hilarious because I'll say these words and everyone will light up and just be like, wow, I know that place. And they're like, well, is, the, is Laura's house there and his pa there? And like, yeah, and I grew up inundated with this. And actually, to, to make a long story short, my mother, along with the, uh, the help of the community of, of Mansfield, um, and I'm, I'll be forever grateful uh, for growing up in Mansfield because the entire community came together and helped my, my mother and father and um, her good friend, Pat Allen, um, uh, they wrote a musical about uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and our entire community came together, and it's now in the 23rd year of production. Uh, we we started out with, I think, 20 or 21 people from the from the community. I was you in were, it that very first you and year. I, you and I were in it. We were 10 years old together. Oh, we were farmer, farmer boys. Boy. Oh, farmer boy. Oh, farmer boy. <laughs> oh, farmer boy. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, so we didn't have those kind of voices back when we were ten, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we started out in this in this play, and it had become this uh, it had become this uh, this large phenomenon for the for the town, and uh, literally every year now, I mean, I think in its largest amount there was 130 people from a, a community of about 1,400 people. That's about 10 percent of the people performing this piece that my mother and her friend wrote and um, it's a really special place and it couldn't happen in so many so many communities a lot mm -hmm. of people uh, aren't aren't used to that kind of thing uh, and but fortunately my mother is a very persistent person along with her friends and the support of the community we grew up in this this uh, amazing community uh, of people who really supported the arts and my uh, my whole family we all sing um, my brother and I we've performed um, uh, in Japan and Germany together, uh, about four different operas, and my sister and my whole family all together here in Springfield, uh, we've done, I believe, five operas all together as a family. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we're all musicians and we're all, uh, I just grew up in this very musical family, but uh, I was very, very happy to to have grown into this community that, that allowed the arts to flourish. And, uh, and from a very, very young age. You, you, yeah, you're yeah. I mean, since I could, since I could talk, and you know, and Tim and I, we had grown up singing, and um, uh, we also went to the same church, and so we we grew up uh, performing in in uh, uh, church plays uh, uh, two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. So we had all of these opportunities, and plus, since my parents were were 
creating and doing musicals and melodramas and um, all of these things. We did, golly, I mean, I had a, I had a uh, possibility to perform two or three times per month since the time I was three or four years old. And that's that stage time is invaluable, and it's weird because now when I'm in a professional setting, you know, I'll I'll meet people who just are not comfortable on stage, and and I realize, oh wow, they're going through the phases that I went through when I was five years old on mm -hmm. stage, and like because they're still getting used to an audience being in front of them, and they're, you know, they might technically know what they're doing with their voice, or they know about acting, but they've never had the time in front of people to to create and try to and just just make an ass out of yourself, you know. And to realize that, oh, that's what it's, it's about sharing this moment and this emotion. And a lot of people just have never had those opportunities that, that I had as a child. So for me, it was a, it was a per perfect place to, to grow up. Okay, Tara, let's, uh, let's talk about you. You grew up in Rogersville. I did. Logan, Rogersville, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And you had been involved in, <clears throat> did you do speech and debate? Was I wrong about that? You're wrong. No. Oh, wow. Again? I wasn't allowed to. My okay. choir director was pretty strict. He was Erica. Hardcore. It was your sister that did it. Yeah, she was sister, yeah. fantastic. But you yeah. did choir. You, I did. You, well, I, um, it's an let's exceptional Let's see, the first choir. thing that I did was um, I was Gretel in the Sound of Music for mm -hmm. the high school choir. I was in sixth grade, but I looked like I was five mm -hmm. in sixth grade. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and our, our choir was actually a, a really great choir, and so I learned to love classical music. And... Uh, yeah, in Rogersville, it was one of the most important things. We had all the cool kids were in choir, so, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was yeah, really that's, exciting. That's to, the most and we had thing. wonderful musicals. Yeah, the, we, we talk about how important was, um, but uh, music was really important in Rogersville, too, because um, that's the funny thing. If uh, all the cool kids were actually in choir and sports were kind of on the back burner, most of the money um, that came into the school were because the choir was so great and they and the choir director was um, such a good uh, diplomat, um, he was able to get a lot of money into the school district. Who was that? It's, um, Remember? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Brad Barrett. Uh, yeah, that was back in, well, let's see, how, how long I was the choir? I graduated in 90s. 97. 90s, yeah. I was giving him a little shout out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it was a very interesting uh, um, situation for you guys because, I mean, f from how, how young were you when you had um, well, voice I started lessons? voice lessons. Well, with him, he would give voice lessons to everyone in choir, you know, uh, if you wanted it or if it worked out. I mean, since sixth grade or fifth grade, eh, his favorite people. But, uh, yeah, so it was pretty hardcore. We'd have rehearsals at 6.30 in the morning before school and... For chamber choir and yeah, I was it was like a sport. I mean, good yeah. discipline. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Mike grew up in Mansfield. Mm -hmm. Tara grew up in Rogersville. Rogersville. And I the two cities are about twenty-five miles apart. Mm -hmm. yep. You grew up right in between. In us. between, I grew up in Seymour. <laughs> yeah. We done Just got right us right at McDonald's in two thousand. Um, and you see more and see more because it's a flat plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. That, that's true. Um, <laughs> when was the first time you two met that you remember? Technically. Was it when we were in like, in like uh, sixth grade or? Yeah, when, yeah. When I mean, we, we were, were in we were in honor we're in the same age, and choir. we were always in honor choirs. Mm -hmm. and yeah, at, a, like at that. Evangel, and, and you know, I mean, she was from the famed Rogersville uh, choir group, and you know, she was the songbird of Rogersville. <laughs> 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 and but, so, you know. Yeah, but then uh, we uh, became kind of friends. Yeah, kind of friends uh, our, our when we were in, in high, high school. school. Because Did it ever go any farther than that? Teacher. No. No, I mean, because, well, we were, uh, I mean, I was in high school, and, she, well. I'm sure you, you know, tried, but. Yeah, of course. Well, no, I couldn't, no. I couldn't drive in high school. My, my mother was, my mother was amazing, but extremely overprotective. <laughs> <laughs> and as Tim knows, um, we weren't allowed to, to drive outside of Mansfield. Um, and the nearest town is 15 minutes away, and we couldn't even drive to, to Seymour, <laughs> which is 15 minutes away, which is, um, but there's not there's not a whole lot to do in Mansfield um, when I was growing up, uh, other than um, play basketball with their friends uh, or um, or put on plays. So that's what we did, and so but that's that was a perfect upbringing for me. <laughs> okay, so we've got you through high school. Mm -hmm. When you left high school, where did you go to school at? I went for two years to uh, well, at the time it was SMSU, but I guess uh, MSU now. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah, mm -hmm. MSU. I went for for two years and. Um, uh, that was my academic time here in the states. But okay, so you didn't you didn't graduate? No, I did not. He hated it. 
Yeah, I absolutely hate it. I, I'm asking these questions like I have distance, but I was actually Mike's roommate. Uh, yeah. He that. knows <laughs> everything. Yeah, I know all of this stuff. Uh, Tara, you went to? I went to Drury um, with uh, Michael's brother, Sean, mm-hmm. and was in the music program there and did all the operas and, uh, yeah, you performed. You studied under? Uh, Rosemary Jackson. And uh, Michael, actually, when we were at Drury, we brought him in as, like, a guest artist yeah, um, I, I quit to do operas and, uh, I came at over Drury. and did, did operas with And so me and my brother and her, uh-huh. we all Jay did Jay Jackson was our director and yeah. Rosemary's son. So Okay, so you, after two years at MSU, or uh-huh. then M- SMSU, you went to St. Louis? Uh, no, after two years I quit and became extremely depressed and uh, lived with my parents and off and on with a girlfriend uh, at the time. And for almost five years I didn't really perform on stage. Um, I, I was able to, to do two smaller parts with the uh, Springfield Regional Opera, but for about five years, literally, I was just doing uh, every job that I could. Uh, what do you think? Was, uh, what do you think caused that depression? Um, not being able to, to pursue what I wanted to, which the thing that I wanted most in the world was to sing and make a living at it and have a have a great time. And I I went um, after I quit. I decided I I needed to go to New York, like everybody thinks they need to do. And I went to New York, and I auditioned in New York and Philadelphia for schools and things. But I didn't get in because um, I, I just wasn't ready at the time, and I didn't have the, the type of voice that they were looking for. And I'm kind of uh, a cocky, independent type. And mm. that doesn't go over well when you first meet people uh, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and, so, uh, and, and especially uh, for me, it just did... Uh, when I was 21, I just I I know that I wasn't ready really to move away from this area because I have a really strong family life and and I love I love this area and I love the people here and I didn't want to move up to New York uh, because I just didn't like the idea of city life and in order to pursue a career uh, in especially in opera <clears throat> it's almost I mean it's virtually impossible to to uh, pursue a career in the Midwest um, as an opera singer. Uh, the the only possible way is if if you go into uh, uh, IU in Indiana and then you go to to the East Coast or the West Coast. But most of my opera friends, um, you know, they started out and they did all the schools. Um, but uh, the United States is it's very difficult um, because there's so many people that want to want to perform and there's so little jobs comparatively to the rest of the parts of the world. And that's what led to me after five years of really practicing. Um, what I would do is I was a construction worker and and uh, I was substitute teaching for my mom and uh, and doing all of these kind of odd jobs for Pin Mac and short term. But all the while the singing was still there. The oh completely. I, I was, remember. Oh go ahead George. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, and, and to uh, stick myself into the interview here. I remember our audition, uh, 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 directing um, Girl of the Golden West, uh, yes. and, and you were in that. So yeah. uh, where does that fit? Where, where, that was uh, my sophomore year of college. Okay, all right. Yeah. Oh, I was just curious. I just yeah, didn't... yeah, just, just um, well, that's when we, uh, I auditioned for it, yeah, in sophomore year of college, and that's when I had just quit college. And, mm. uh, yeah, so I was just freshly... Freshly on my own, becoming an opera singer. That was my I first. That you. was my first opera to direct. You oh, know, wow. that was an interesting experience because I <laughs> yeah. don't speak Italian, so it yeah. was all this <laughs> kind of weird looking at the translation back yeah. and forth and making yeah. sure what you guys were trying to sing was <laughs> the, stage, nice the staging was matching. You know. Not all directors do that, so yeah. that's no, good. literally, that's really not. <laughs> I've done, I've done, done operas and uh, let's see, where was it in Italy? Uh, we were doing a German opera, and the the Italian um, uh, director didn't speak a word of German. Um, <laughs> he didn't even care to to learn. He was just he just worked on off of the Italian translation, mm-hmm. and um, it was unfortunately a bad Italian translation. So a lot of the actions that he had us do weren't going with the musical context of of what the German was. And someone who had done the the Italian translation, however, hundred years ago, yeah. just just did a bad job of it. You know? oh, God. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> There's not always high art going on everywhere. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it was fun. I enjoyed doing that. Yeah, yeah I've, definitely. I've done two. I guess I did that in Carmen, but oh, okay. that's the only operas okay. I've done. But maybe I'll do another yeah. one of these days. Yeah, they're they're. It's an interesting genre to go into. Um, it's it's very, uh, it's very stifled by um, by other people, though. Unfortunately, um, that's why I, I, I love opera because to me it it can be the highest form of of art and music and dance and everything fitting together but you have to have such assimilation and so many people working together 
exactly at the same time in order to achieve what the the composer wanted. It, you you can't take your own times uh, because you have 150 people working, you know, backstage and on stage, trying to do what you're. If you're trying to sing love and you're putting one hand out and there's a light cue and I mean all of these things have to go along with the conductor putting a downbeat and a bunch of people paying attention to a conductor going oh and understanding the conductor right and that's why it's, it's it takes a lot of a lot of practice um, to to get right and that's why unfortunately uh, opera fails so many times because people aren't willing to put in the the extra work that uh, that it takes to for timing or timing you know what's that's one of my favorite jokes is like uh, what's the secret to a good joke timing what yeah Exactly. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. Get Who's it? on first? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, um, I'm going to totally break into the flow of what we got going here. Because yeah, sure. as, as talking about people not understanding concepts and, and things like that, you, you were telling me a funny story the other night about an opera in Europe that included um, a toilet. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. That's, a, that's a wonderful one. Well, the the interesting thing about uh, Europe is that hold on, um, just like you yeah. should see George's face right now. He's like, what? <laughs> where are he we knows going? where this is going. <laughs> well, um, there's this uh, there's this uh, he's famous and infamous all at once. Um, uh, a director that's been around for the last fifteen years, um, very avant garde, um, and his name is uh, Calixto Beato, and he's uh, basically the most uh, out there director that anyone in any. If people throw around the the word Euro trash. Um, this, I mean, he's basically the one that that came up with that entire idea, <laughs> and uh, I mean, he merits it. He, he's coming from a, a very different place than most directors, but but he goes a little far in my uh, area just to try to push people, push people's boundaries. And 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 for me, um, a lot of times it doesn't do exactly what he's trying to do. Like for instance, this was one um, opera that he was trying to do. Uh, his centerpiece was a giant toilet. And one of my friends was on the production team, and he's a he you know went for six years um, to art school. He's an amazing um, uh, uh, set designer, and uh, he had to design. And they had a production meeting. There was ten people sitting around a table, and they had to have a serious discussion of <laughs> what, <laughs> what what is the most uh, lifelike. Um, uh, feces uh, look that they can go for to, to spew out of the toilet. What's the most lifelike feces? And they're sitting around, and um, all of these Germans are sitting around, like maybe we could do some chocolate with peanut butter and these kind of things and put them in. And my friend just got up in the production meeting and was like, "You guys are on your own. This is this is not art anymore. Um, I'm we've gone so far into um, into an odd idea of a concept, and this is so far from the ideas. And I'm leaving. And uh, you know, but that's the that's the extremes of um, what a lot of because art is now um, in in this in the sense that we're talking about art as as far as pushing boundaries and the ideas of uh, what art should be, which is uh, putting a mirror up to society and showing social change. Um, it has done that for a long time in Europe, uh, but unfortunately, it's now it's completely government subsidized, and a lot of it is just factory art, like literally you come in it's paint by numbers art and um people are people are going so far off the deep end that they're trying to find any way that they can have shock value well, like, there's there's always there's a, a a term in in my side of the business called an auteur director yeah. who uh believes that they have the right to mm -hmm. put their personal stamp on the production and i have philosophical debates with other artists all the time because my personal my personal view on on as a director is my job is to actualize what the composer or the writer intent was and it gives Precisely. me a lot it gives you a lot of, of 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 breath but there comes a point if you start twisting you know yeah. the concept or the, or the idea of the intent of what the, the writer was doing then i i feel like you are uh uh, being very selfish, in my opinion, but yeah. that's always a big debate with with artists: is, is is what is the role of the director or the? Yeah, and I can understand. And um, where the director is very important, but in the last uh, couple of decades, a lot of people um, have forgotten that uh, the piece that is written, unless the director has written it themselves, um, the piece is the reason that people are coming there, not because of someone's vision. 
the the piece is what brings people and draws people in the audience and in the interpretation of the piece but I mean I've been involved with some some directors that are so narcissistic that um, uh, they will absolutely um, demand that their name is above um, the uh, Puccini you know um, saying well this is my interpretation so put my name twice as the size of Puccini and then um, you know oh that's irrelevant it's my vision you know <laughs> and it's just People, people get into their own idea and <clears throat> have to think that they are they are so amazing and they've they've come up with something brilliant. Sometimes they get very cocky. Yes, they do. <laughs> Which might have been one of my problems. <laughs> my problems when I started out. Never, yeah. never. <laughs> okay, okay. I've, I've taken us off topic um, and I fully accept. On purpose. Yeah, on purpose. I stopped him. Let's, okay, we've got you through your college years. You And then you my decided. My college years, yeah, but she she had, um, uh, during the time that of my five years of, of uh, working and doing odd jobs and things. Um, I did the more standard path, really. Yeah. I mean, I. Uh, graduated from Drury and then I went on to uh, immediately to get my master's at UNC Greensboro uh, in North Carolina and but then I stopped halfway I quit after a year and then I worked at an opera company in Asheville North Carolina for two years where I did all the business stuff and I um, created their education outreach program and I also performed in productions and got paid very little uh, to do about everything. So Did you live on that wage? No, I couldn't. <laughs> no, thank goodness I have a nice family and a nice lady who rented a little house to me for basically nothing. Um, yeah. Uh, then I got married. Not to you. Yeah. And then we moved to uh, D.C. and I finished my master's in Baltimore at the Peabody Conservatory. Okay. So, yeah, so she's a master. I, I usually yeah. call her Master Stafford Spires. Yeah, I make him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, not really. <laughs> so, Mike, you moved to Europe. When? Yeah. Um, let's see. That was back in 2004, I believe. That's when I first moved to, uh, to, to Europe. Well, I'd, I, started, I started traveling to Europe from the time, uh, from 99, because I was involved in this organization called the World Youth Choir. And um, it's this organization where you audition by, uh, by tape and send it in. Back when we had tapes. Uh, and uh, see, if, uh, see if you could get in part of this, this huge choir that was made up of uh, different representatives from different countries. And that was originally my, uh, uh, my foot into Europe and getting to meet some certain conductors, but it was all through choirs. Um, and uh, my, my ex-wife, who uh, that's, I, she was originally in the choir. That's how I met her when I was 19. And we were friends for, for a long time. And then, uh, then after about four years, um, that's when we, we became uh, a couple, and then we got married. And uh, we needed some place to live, but we knew that uh, she's because she Serbia. was she's from Serbia, uh, which is ex-Yugoslavia, um, it was almost impossible for for us to to live in the United States with her being Serbian because of visa issues. And um, even though she was married to an American, yeah, 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 it was it was very uh, tough because after 9/11, uh, they made the uh, they made the regulations so strict uh, that you had to have. You had to have a pretty stable job in order to have your your uh, significant other, and and the arts aren't usually the most stable job, especially on applications. <laughs> okay, <laughs> for loans or anything. <laughs> so when you're in Europe, how did you get by? Uh, I was singing in this. Uh, I had certain friends from uh, from the World Youth Choir that were that lived in Vienna and said you should come and uh, audition at the conservatory here, and you could probably get into this uh, professional choir, uh, which is. If you're wanting to become a, a a singer, a lot of times that's not the path that most singers ever wanted to do, uh, which is choir work. And you have to do four to six hours of rehearsals and and performances. And I went while I was in Vienna, uh, I was able to to get into the conservatory uh, in Vienna, and it was a perfect place for me because I didn't have to do anything other than sing there. And they have all of the best uh, coaches and and and. Uh, um, Let's see uh, the people for language coaches um, and musical coaches and leader, uh, which uh, they are all there in conservatory. And they're if you get into the conservatory, it only costs I think a thousand dollars per year to go to the conservatory. And 
for me, it was a, just an invaluable place uh, that I went for two years, and I was able to learn German. But I moved over there, like, not speaking one word of German. I could fake my way in um, songs, but I didn't speak any German. I didn't speak any French or Italian or anything. Uh, but I knew that all I wanted to do was sing, and I was willing to give up anything. And I literally moved over there with my savings that my, my grandpa left me, which was about uh, $1,500. And that's what I moved to Europe with, having no contacts other than maybe I'm going to audition for this school and maybe I'll uh, get into this choir. But I knew that I couldn't stay in um, in Springfield, even though I loved it and I loved my family. I knew I was only going to be happy if I if I pursued my singing career, <coughs> and that's that's what I had to do. And it was years of uh, years of uh, of rejection until you know until. I I made some contacts and people that that liked what I did and and it's only been in the last two and a half years that things have really the ball has really started rolling you know but literally and everyone that I I've talked to it takes five to ten years anywhere you go to even get your foot in the door um, and you just, un, unless you're one of the really lucky ones but most of the time those really lucky ones are are you know shooting stars yeah, they they'll, they'll get out. in they'll wow that's amazing yeah. and then oh yeah someone else is uh five years younger than you and smarter and funnier so goodbye <laughs> okay so your first big role in an opera in okay, europe the first first big role in opera in europe was um <clears throat> Well, the the first significant role in an, in an opera house was uh, actually Giacchino in uh, Beethoven's Fidelio, and uh, that was in uh, Naples in uh, the famous uh, opera house in uh, Napoli, mm -hmm. and it was it was a it was a smaller role, but it was the first significant thing that made me realize that wow, this is actually going to happen. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna make it because I had auditioned, I'd say thirty thirty auditions and got absolutely nothing. And that's really rare because, first of all, I'm a tenor, uh, which is the rarest category of voice, which usually if you're a tenor, you'll get, you'll get jobs anywhere. But I did 30 auditions and got nothing. And then finally, after a, an audition, someone talked to someone else, and I got this one job. And it just snowballs after that. But most people aren't willing to put up with the, with the years of rejection and the years of auditioning and having to struggle and go deeper into debt and deeper into debt most people can't can't deal with that and i mean i i barely pulled out of it either you know just emotionally and financially it's uh it's a real it's a real mind game but if you know that there's no there's no way you're going to be happy unless you are doing what you love which is for me performing and being able to do things like this talk to friends about what really matters in my life uh which is art and the pursuit of 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 critical thinking and higher knowledge that's you know I'm not going to be happy and I knew that that was I was willing to give up anything for that and I couldn't I couldn't do the the regular jobs like other people did I just I wouldn't have made it <laughs> and since then you uh, and this is just a few of the opera roles you mentioned uh, Fidelio you've also had roles in La Boheme La Traviata Candide La Gazzetta did I pronounce mm -hmm. that correctly uh, Die Zauberflute, which is that, is that the magic mm -hmm. flute? Magic flute, yeah. Okay. Romeo and Juliet, La Cenerentola, William Tell, La Donna del Lago, Betulia Liberata, mm -hmm. and La Gazza Ladra. Hey, and that's just a few. Nice um, Italian pronunciation. Nice. Woohoo! Italiano bene. I speak good and junk. Um, <laughs> you just finished a tour with Sir John Elliot Gardner. Yes, sir. Uh, and um, I, I want to break in here and say Mike um, brought me to New York to see him at Carnegie Hall. And that was one of the neatest things I've ever done. I sat there at Carnegie Hall with Tara mm -hmm. and sat next to her as yes. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony started. And as soon as Mike <laughs> came out on stage as, as one of the soloists and started singing, Tara looked over at me and <laughs> we were both a little bit teary-eyed. Yeah, uh, it, 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 was, it was wonderful. Um, Thank you. And then you were back, uh, you, you did Beethoven's Ninth on Friday, you did uh, Beethoven's uh, Misa Solemnis the next night, mm -hmm. and then you were back a week later doing, mm -hmm. at Carnegie Hall, you are back in New York doing... Yeah, uh, let's see, actually it was about, a, about two weeks afterwards because we, we, had a, we had a break and it was just before Thanksgiving, and then right after Thanksgiving I had to fly back and I did, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, with a totally different uh, uh, organization at Carnegie Hall doing an opera from Bellini called the Beatrice di Tenda, which was based on a an actual historical event of the 
the the Duke of Milan's wife uh, was sentenced to death because of infidelity charges, um, were, which were completely uh, unfounded. But it, it was based on a true story. So, mm. just like a lot of a lot of opera, you know, they try to take and truly what the what the word of opera means is the the height of human emotion, and it's that's why it's so dramatic. <laughs> okay, and you have been um, on cast recordings of. Mm -hmm. uh, La Gazzetta, Otello, and La Siege de Corinth. Yes, La Siege de Corinth. And yeah. uh, those were for Naxos, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And your first solo album, A Fool for Love, debuted in September 2011. Yeah. And uh, Olivia Giovetti of Aprovor, uh, a program on WQXR, called it one of the top ten recordings to buy in 2011. Yeah, cool. pretty cool. Let's, let's talk about a little bit, a couple minutes, about how that project came about. And also, if you could uh, tell us your favorite song from the album. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, uh, I had talked to, unfortunately, when, back when I was in Vienna the first time in our, my first year, I was lucky enough to, to be chosen from the conservatory to represent the conservatory in this small uh, project that they were doing, Mozart's Requiem in uh, Moscow. No, it was St. Petersburg, actually. And that was the first time that I was able to go to Russia. And um, I made a good contact with the with the lady who ran the festival. And she really liked me, and she, she loved tenors. And that began, began a collaboration with her and her husband, uh, whose name is uh, Konstantin Orbelian. And he's he's quite well known. He was a, a piano prodigy when he was a child, and then went into conducting. And now he has his own record label, and uh, is quite well known <clears throat> worldwide as a conductor uh, because he he was the first uh, American-born uh, conductor to ever be the head of uh, uh, the uh, uh, of a major orchestra in Russia. So uh, so he's quite prominent, interesting man, and he he really liked me as a as a person and said we've got to do something together and I said well I've been working on this idea and I've it's always been my dream to make a to make an album uh, so uh, here's my idea and he really liked the concept and we had to tweak a couple of things for almost a year and then uh, Tara and I um, we did we did two concerts with it. how many concerts did we do Constantine I think I've, I've done a total of five concerts mm -hmm. in Moscow and Russia I've been there I mean twice. In Moscow and uh, st. Petersburg <coughs> and she and I have sung together twice um, in Moscow and st. Petersburg and uh, and he was his recording studios and his uh, orchestra is, is based in Moscow and so I flew to Moscow and uh, we got to record this but it was a very uh, interesting procedure and to give you an idea that it's it's extremely rare to to make a professional recording nowadays and even more so with a full orchestra yeah. and and we had yeah just because of money involved it just costs so much to to pay for all of those things and for for when I was in Moscow we had literally um, it was nine hours of uh, let's see no eleven hours of studio time and that was for the orchestra who had never been together to rehearse as well. Plus, we didn't have good music, so most of the time, uh, out of that those five days, and we could only book <laughs> book the, uh, the 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 studio recording place uh, from I think it was ten in the morning mm -hmm. till one in the afternoon. Uh, Tara and I were having to go to bed and get up at three in the morning in order to record this, and you know. It really high operatic arias are, are it's hard for difficult, a, especially for a tenor, yeah, a tenor at, at 10 in the morning to sing yeah. high C's. 10 you know? high C's or whatever. Yeah, I don't turn into a tenor Oof. until much later in the day. It's like a <laughs> bass yeah. until Oh, yeah, noon. definitely. So but. what's your favorite song from the album? Uh, I have to say that uh, for me, the my favorite song is actually Lamenta di Federico, which is at the very end. Uh, the uh, And the reason it's so poignant and uh, makes me just smile every time is because it was always my dream to to make a, a record and in the vein of Mario Lanza because he's the one that inspired me to become a tenor and that was on the first album that I ever bought uh, from uh, Mario Lanza. It was a record when I was uh, 17 and uh, that was on his record and I got to listen to it and I said no matter what I've got to record that for my only CD which maybe that'll be my only CD I ever make as a solo. But I had to put that, and that's why I was so happy. Uh, a Fool for Love is available on Amazon. Yep. Uh, iTunes as iTunes well as a as digital well. download. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it was it, it was one of the top sellers after it debuted on iTunes, if I remember correctly. Cool. I, I did I did I a little know. bit of research. Yeah, you, you know you know more than I do. And uh, what we'll do when George edits this down uh, before we post it, we will pop a song in there. Uh, we were concerned about some legality with the CD, so I think we're going to see if you can send us. Uh, well, I've got I've got a CD, and they said there's no problem with promotion. I I, I talked to them. And said okay, no very good. No problem to promote. Great. So can we good. play that song? Of course we will. Yeah. Now we're going to take a short break. Uh, when we come back. We'll get a little personal and, and talk about how your career choices have affected your lives, family life, sure. your marital life, that kind of thing. You are listening to Art Matters, recorded at the Creamery Art Center in Springfield, Missouri. We'll be right back. This is Art Matters, brought to you by A Class Act Productions with George Cron and Tim Pyland. A Class Act Productions produces the wildly popular parodies of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Star Trek. Upstairs at the Canvas at 315 South Avenue, just one block south of the square and across the street from Ernie Biggs' Dueling Piano Bar. Every third Saturday of the month, you can see our Star Trek parody at 8 p.m. and Buffy the Vampire Slayer at 10 p.m. Tickets are $5 per show, or see the double feature for $8. For more information, go to a Class Act Productions Facebook page, and while you're there, please be sure to like us. All right, we're right. back. Hope you enjoyed that song and, and the little commercial and junk that was in there. <laughs> Let's get a little personal. And All I made right. sure I, I asked them before. Uh, we recorded. If I could ask some of these questions, I feel better now. Uh, you do. <laughs> you, you're always wary because you know Tim pretty well too. Yeah, I do. But I'm still nervous. So. It's okay. <laughs> I'll be as. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> no, no, as don't true say as you're can be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you were both married before. Mm -hmm. yes. You found your way back to each other. Mm -hmm. Michael, we've already touched on that. Uh, your 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 first marriage, how that came about. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that, and then and, and you, you said it was okay to talk about this, that yeah. the, the career affected the relationship. Yeah, definitely. I think it's very important for people to hear this, because this is a side of, of the, the industry that they don't hear, yeah. the, the personal toll it takes on people's lives. Oh, completely, completely. And the most, <clears throat> the most bizarre thing is that uh, I, like everybody else, thought, you know, you, you think you can have everything, you know, we're both going to be performers, and we're both going to have this amazing life. And then we're going to have kids, and we're going to have this travel around the world. But um, the real life uh, sets in because more than likely one person is going to uh, have more success than the other one. And more than likely, you're never going to be able to do projects together unless that is your absolute goal. And and you have lots of backing from other people from other where uh, other places. But she and I, we didn't know anybody in the business, and. Um, she was pursuing a career. Uh, this is my ex-wife, uh, Katarina Bradic, who's actually doing quite well for herself now as a as an opera singer. Um, but she started pr pursuing a career uh, at the same time that I did, and my career started to take off. But literally in the first two years, I'd say we saw each other four months out of those first two years, and um, that's not enough. No, that's not a, that's not a relationship. And I mean, there were lots of other problems, but those just. Uh, uh, when, you, when you're when you away from people and then you come back and all you do is fight, um, it just exacerbates the entire uh, idea of, like, what is this? This isn't a marriage. This isn't a... really isn't a relationship. It's just kind of a... just like, oh, you're you're my friend that every once in a while we hang out. And, uh, and you know, unfortunately for me, I was so driven um, to... Uh, to perfection in my craft and wanted to do everything that I could to, to make my, my career go forward, I was willing to give up uh, my first marriage and uh, for many, many reasons. Um, that's why it didn't work, but I know the biggest reason is just we weren't right for each other and we both made decisions that we wanted to be 
wanted to be opera singers, and for two people performing, um, it's almost impossible, literally. I'm, everybody that, uh, that I've met uh, on the road, uh, almost every, I, I'd say more than 90% of people um, are, are divorced or have uh, children uh, from two or three wives and uh, uh, people don't that are... see them. Yeah, and they don't see them. You know, and that's the weirdest thing is that... And we made the hard decision um, uh, to say that this isn't working and we don't want to... We don't want to have kids and bring them into this this world, and this is terrible. So let's let's end this before we hate each other. But it was amicable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I mean, it's it not very, easy. But no, it was very difficult. Well, you know, relationships uh, they none run smoothly one hundred percent of the time. Yeah. But you have to have time to be together to communicate with one yeah. another to work things out, and so. I mean, yeah, definitely. And with distance involved, you know, <coughs> after a couple of weeks and. And Tara and I, we've, we've talked about this many times, and when we first got together, there was, we just kind of have to make a rule that you, you can't go more than a month uh, not seeing another person because they become an abstract idea in your mind, and you're like, yeah, well, we're, we're a couple, but what are we? And I get, I mean, I know her better than anyone in the world, but she's not physically here in front of me, and it's just, just a bizarre situation because it's, most people don't live their lives like that. Um, if you're a couple, most of the time you you do spend most of your time around each other. But especially when you're in in the arts, you have these strong bonds and these strong relationships between people because literally you meet people for the first uh, hour and you're already talking about high philosophical ideas and whether or not they've uh, they've ever uh, you know uh, been married and what their kids are like and the, all of the barriers are broken down already because most of the people that go into the arts are willing to just put everything out there. And you form these really strong bonds really quickly, and you know, most of the people know uh, that after three weeks or after four weeks, you'll never see these people again in your life. Uh, but that's part of the, the beauty of the, of the, uh, the whole relationship of of what the arts are is that people are willing to get together and be completely vulnerable and give them themselves and then have to give that up. But um, but Tara and I, we both realized that earlier on in our relationship that we're going to have to make we're going to have to make rules and um, that since my career was going so well, um, there are certain things that um, that she can't do in order it, because our our relationship together is so much more important than than either of us in our careers individually, but we knew that that uh, since my career was going so well, um, that she wouldn't be able to perform as much. And um, Tara, do you feel slighted <clears throat> by that? Oh, I uh, like last year I didn't do very much, and it was a little bit sad because I've, you know, am extremely happy when I'm performing or when I have mm -hmm. projects to work on. But this coming year, I've got four things, and I, I think that's perfect. Michael and I yeah. are doing two things together. I'm doing too much now. Oh. She's um, doing the right amount. Let's, yeah. Let's, in a so week? I'm, it's working out really well for us, and I, yeah. I, don't have, I don't have the goal to sing at the Met or whatever. I have the goal to be the best performer I can be in, in a weird whatever that I do. Yes. twist of fate, a weird twist of fate, you two will be in a production, uh, Michael, oh. with your ex-wife. Yeah. Oh, wait. Weirder, <laughs> she will be. I will be a little boy, and she will be my mother. <laughs> is that Freudian? Bravo, <laughs> well played, Fate. <laughs> the universe okay. is a wonderful place. Yeah, but I like her so. No, I mean, yeah, we it's don't all amicable, any, and yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, well, this she's is the okay with this. Is the funniest? The funniest thing is how we got together and how she and her current. Uh, um, I don't know if they're married or not now, but. So. Um, their, uh, her current partner, they got together. I was supposed to do a Rigoletto in Japan with her, uh, but I canceled in order to do a Rigoletto here in Springfield uh, with Tara. And she, um, after those productions, she, she, uh, she became a good friend with, uh, um, with one of the people that were in the performance. Um, and that was during the, the period that uh, I was, uh, we were going through divorce and uh, Tara was in the same, a similar situation in her life. And we know that uh, we more than likely um, wouldn't have gotten together or would have gotten together mm. m way down the road. Let's let's know? talk about that. Uh, Thank actually. you, SRO. Yeah. yeah. It's Springfield <laughs> Regional <laughs> Opera. Well, yeah. A lot of people yeah. owe a lot to that oh, organization. Yeah, 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 really. Tara, 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, you, you only have to talk about things you're comfortable about. Let's talk about your first marriage, if you're comfortable with that. Oh, well, I mean, um, whenever we were first together, it was, it was pretty supportive, or, you know. But it's, it's weird to be with someone who is not, it works for some people to be with a person who is not in your profession. But it was hard for me because I really couldn't share what I loved and I felt like he didn't understand and didn't, and, you know, it kind of bothered him that I loved something so much that, you know, wasn't him. And so, um, yeah, I just, you know, and plus, you know, bad communication. I mean, just normal things that when people don't work, they don't work. But, mm-hmm. hey, I, yeah. music still had something to do with it. And, you know, it, I I wasn't as supported as I wanted to be and and needed. Uh, yeah, needed. Yeah, needed. yeah and it's Absolutely. not like the, he's a bad person but if no, we but just weren't together long enough and we realized yeah. later that it wasn't a good fit you yeah. know because you live life uh when you're dating in different cities and you know and it's wonderful and then you come together and try to make life work and try to both have careers in the fields that you want and uh, it doesn't always work. And the, yeah, the reality of the situation, a lot of people don't realize that if one person is an, uh, is an artist and the other person has a more uh, normal life as a lawyer or something else, um, people start, the, b- because you don't make that much money, and most people never make uh, very much money in the arts, um, and like I was telling uh, Tim earlier, uh, Charles Grodin um, came on uh, just recently and came out with a, a DVD called um, Show Business. Uh, show Biz- it's all about show business and um, and the reality of what show business is, and it's called Enter at Your Own Risk. And Remind everybody um, who Charles Grodin is. Charles Grodin was um, the guy that became uh, famous in uh, the Beethoven movies, and he was also in The Great Muppet Caper, but he's one of those guys that everybody kind of knows. But he started out as a um, eighteen year old and I think his first thing he ever did was uh twenty thousand leagues under the sea in like nineteen fifty four and then he was in the business and didn't have another thing on his i m d b credit for another seventeen years and then another ten years later he did another thing and then another twenty years later he was known as in the Beethoven things but he had been in around um uh the business for well over fifty years and he's He's 77 now, and this is kind of a no holds barred DVD, just saying just the reality of it, not discouraging anybody to get, and I would never discourage anybody from going into the arts, but people need to know that um, 3% of uh, people that ever go into the arts um, ever make a, a true living and can pay all of their bills and do all of their things um, that, that they want to do and have a, a rich, fulfilling, artistic life while doing and while making money at it. Um, and 1% are the actual celebrities. And and I have to say that's absolutely true in the opera world because um, now I'm, I'm just, I've been able to get up into that, um, that smaller percentage because of, because of hard work and, um, and connections and the speciality of me being a tenor uh, and even more so in a tenor that does roles that barely anybody in the world do because literally the roles that I get hired for I know the if I don't get cast, I know the other two guys that are going to have that role. <laughs> um, literally, yeah. I'm like, oh, is it me or is it John or is it, is it? Oh no, no, it's uh, yeah, it's Eric this time. Okay, so you know, and we kind of, I, I just made this little niche for myself, and that's the only way that I made it because I tried to do what other people did and do all of these other operas that uh, and do auditions that everyone sings. Traditional, yeah. Yeah, the traditional way, um, but I didn't get anywhere, and that's why I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything and everyone kept telling me well you need to do what everybody else is doing and go to conservatory and move to new york do all the auditions but i just couldn't do that for myself and i'm not discouraging anyone from from doing that but i think we all need to find our own way especially and you I just mean, have to be aware of how difficult it is yeah. and how much you have to give up yeah because yeah. even when michael was singing in carnegie hall uh, or he sings with someone a soprano who sings in the met she, you know, some of these sopranos, which is like the most common voice type, they sing at the Met, but they only have a couple of things to do yeah, every year. You a can't, year, and they and they're, can't they're totally as much pay as... their bills. And yeah, I mean, there yeah. are 
some sopranos who can, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. but some who but sing in really prestigious houses and and are could be f- are famous. And a girl from France who's like yeah. the most famous singer. She's she's, she's, she's famous. I mean, she she is famous in France and she's on TV all the time and on Decca Records. Um, but uh, she literally she she would was talking to me. It's like, do you get, do you guys know of any jobs that I can I can get coming up? Because I have nothing for a year and a half yeah. and. Um, it's right hard. now, it's hard to hard to pay bills. Even though she's on television, she's got CDs out. She's married to a famous uh, conductor, but that's just the reality of the situation. You know? I want to bring up sort of a, a different tact on that. Um, uh, um, we're talking about the demand, the demands of performing in opera and, yeah. and theatrical type productions. Um, a dear a, a friend of mine, um, he's retired few years now. Uh, Michael Sylvester was an opera singer. Are you familiar yes, with Michael? Yes, he was fantastic. Yeah, he was very fine. In the 80s, and he was amazing. Yeah, he, he was doing some good uh, things. He, he retired, and we said, why, I, my wife and I were visiting with him, him and his wife, uh, Michelle, and we said, why Why did you retire? Your, your, you know, your, your voice seems, he says, no, it's not my voice. He says, uh, performing opera uh, around Europe, I did so much rake stage productions that his back Oh, it was wow. his back that finally gave out on him. He says, I couldn't... Uh, is that true? I mean, do you do a lot of... Uh, do you find I do a lot of weird things, yeah, with my staging. And I, but I'm, I'm only 33 now, um, and I haven't had any of those problems yet. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, demands, and especially now, um, physically, uh, th- people are, and audiences are demanding a little, little bit out of reality. They're, everyone wants everyone to look like a... Uh, you know, a '40s movie star. So mm-hmm. that means, like, you know, just perfect. You know, you know, chest 50 <laughs> and uh, stomach 28. Um, but uh, most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> to be honest, you know, you need you need lung capacity, and you need uh, you need uh, a big you need a strong foundation uh, to be able to sing. And uh, uh, there are a lot of physical demands. Like now, just recently, I just did this. Uh, one of the greatest projects that I've, I've ever been involved with. This is uh, the uh, it's uh, Danation de Faust, which is the the uh, the old story of Faust that people are, might be aware of about a man later in his life decides to sell his soul to the devil because he's never never experienced true love. And uh, I did that, but it just didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shucky <laughs> dang, Darren. Well, um, I I was able to do it with uh, um, my. Well, he was the biggest influence when I was a kid, and it was always my dream to meet Terry Gilliam, who was oh, wow. the, the director of uh, you know, Monty Python, all the things of Monty Python and the adventures of Ben Munchausen and Twelve Monkeys and all these things. And I, I got to be the lead in his first opera. Excellent. And uh, in this, uh, in this uh, one of the last scenes, I was uh, hung 30 foot up, uh, upside down on a swastika. <laughs> Um, so the physical man's are, are are very awkward. I mean, but I I I mean, everyone has their own um, ability to to say yes or no. But I'm kind of a daredevil and a little bit crazy. And she yeah. was really scared. Yeah. I was. Oh gosh, it was dangerous. It was, a little, it was a little dangerous because sometimes, well, especially in Italy, they don't have uh, as strong. Oh well, um, that was another story. <laughs> when you the set fell when you were in Milan. Yeah, 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 and they had to stop the. Uh, Stop the uh, the dress rehearsal because we heard screams and a large set fall. Then the the regulations are a little lacking. Yeah, it's sort of the Spider Man musical. Yeah, yeah, it was totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like turn out the dark. Exactly. Yeah, but with a lot more controlled yelling. That's what I call opera singing. All right, let's run it back a little bit. Um, you you we've gone through your marriages. SRO Springfield Regional Opera brought you back together. Yes, we can definitely Thank say you. that. Uh, has there been, and this is a question for both of you, a singular moment in your professional careers, an aha moment where you were performing and you just went, it all clicked into place? Michael, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, it has to be the, well, I mean, there's, there's been many aha moments, but one of the greatest is literally um, uh, being able to perform. In the last two years, I've been able to for- perform with the, two living legends and conductors that were, uh, you know, I'm on stage and especially doing um, this this one opera that you pronounced, the Betuli Liberata, um, with Riccardo Muti. He was this, uh, he's probably the most prominent and famous conductor um, in all of classical music. 
and he's this legend that's been on everything that I've ever seen, but he was up there, and I was singing some of the highest uh, poetry ever written and beautiful music from Mozart, and him conducting me, and I'm standing there singing, uh, Se Dio veder tu voi, uh, guarda l'oinon yo getto, which means, if you want to seek God, look within yourself. And hmm. all of us in the entire room, it's this beautiful, beautiful moment. And it's just me standing there seeing this and Muti looking at me and slowly conducting. And it was just this moment that everyone was breathing together and the orchestra was calm. And I was singing this beautiful piece and I just realized, wow, I'm doing everything that I ever wanted to. I'm working with work with great musicians. I'm, I'm doing high art. I'm... I'm becoming transcendental of my own body, um, and I'm in this moment where I'm looking at other people, and everybody in the in the house was crying, literally, and I was crying on stage, and other people in the orchestra, you know, it was just this magical moment where the everything was right, and I realized that there's there's nothing in the world that can that can be better than this, a, a moment where everybody comes together and is working for the same common goal and that's that's when when I really realized it artistically that was incredible okay Tara <laughs> well how do you follow that <laughs> should have let the lady well, go honestly, first honestly I mean oh. this just shows my kind of teacheriness of me it's not so much about the career or <laughs> opera as like a performance I think the, the most special times in my life have been with uh, when I do uh, education programs and I take operas out to schools um, when I see little kids who don't even know what classical music is like when I was in the small poor towns in uh, North Carolina in the, the mountains there and and I go in for a week and I teach them about classical music first and then about opera, and then we make up our own opera, and then have a big performance at the end. I mean, it's just that's unbelievable to share and with with kids to bring in a new audience for opera, this really special art form, and show that it's not scary and it shouldn't be intimidating, and you know everyone can enjoy it. And that's when that's what I I've really loved in my life to see. Well, years ago there was little a little faces. kid in Mansfield, Missouri that mm. uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, you know, that's you yeah. learned a wonderful thing by yeah. doing that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Mike, uh, real quick because I, I I we are running over time. Um you have a job. Yes. Let's take New York, for example, because I got to see that firsthand. You you fly in, you get into the hotel. It's not a relaxing time. It's work. No, yeah, definitely. And a lot of times um, I have the craziest uh, schedule because sometimes, uh, let's see, last year when I was doing, um, uh, I was doing rehearsals and performances in, um, in Belgium and Italy, and I, was, uh, I had, two, uh, I had two, uh, two days of rehearsal, then I'd have to fly to Italy uh, late at 10 o'clock at night. I would arrive into Italy. I would drive Michael to the airport. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, and then in I would Italy, have to, I, was I would terrified. have to get, get there, and then I'd um, I'd do a performance um, the next day. Then uh, fly out. She would pick me up at seven in the morning, he and then I would come sleep. back to to rehearsals in two different countries and having to switch between three languages during those um, those two days. It was a very bizarre time. So it's taken a lot of time of uh, adjustment, but the biggest thing is it, everything has to be scheduled i mean it literally she and i have to be like military schedulers literally when we come home or on a job um, i have to do you know i mean we have we have a little bit of time of leeway but most of the time it's like uh two hours here um i'm gonna do this then we've got three hours for rehearsal and i've got 30 minutes for for eating and that's and we don't have the same schedules as anybody anybody else um usually rehearsals depending on the country will be uh, from 10 in the morning till 10 at night, um, or they'll be um, 3 in the afternoon till till midnight, or, you know, just, it's just a totally different schedule depending on um, the, the opera company. Yes. So, and you used to say it's very, very hectic, mm -hmm. yeah. but very fulfilling. Oh, incredibly, uh, but you have to get used to, to um, last year I sleep, uh, we slept on 62 different beds. And most of the time, they're not good And they're beds. not comfortable at yeah. all. And so you have to get most used to kind of living, um, you know, half awake most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, it seems that all of your life choices, good and bad, have brought you together. 
you are mm -hmm. the culmination of your experiences. Given the choice, would you do anything differently? No. No. Absolutely nothing because you, you learn from every failure you ever make yeah. and what's life other than trying things out and, and, and seeing if it succeeds and try, try again. Yeah, and if you would have made a different decision then possibly you wouldn't be here or wouldn't we wouldn't be, be here and I wouldn't yeah. be here and I wouldn't know what I know. And Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Well, guys, I, I know I speak for George, too, when I want to say thank you so much for coming out today. You have to speak for me. <laughs> I spe you speak for you. I'll turn the microphone over to George. I can say yeah. for myself that it's been a pleasure. You should see the look no. he just shot you. <laughs> <laughs> Was it great, guy? <laughs> great seeing you guys, and what a wonderful yeah, interview. It's, so it's been a wonderful yeah. afternoon. It's, so. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind service. It's a kind service you're doing tonight. Uh, to the people that listen to this, to get another perspective on what it's like. Oh, thank you, thank you guys for doing this podcast. It's yeah. very, very important because um, I know um, that there's not many things like that around here, yeah. and um, I really appreciate. It. And arts do matter. And, and in Springfield, lot. I'm really. It is always nice to come home to Springfield to see how the arts are flourishing and growing. I mean, it's a special place. Honestly, I'm proud of this town. Really. And as always, uh, we end our podcast. I would like to end with a little segment that I call Good Thoughts. Oh, no. George is not a fan of this segment. He doesn't necessarily like it. But go ahead, say what you want to say. No, no, you go ahead first, then I'll say what I... Okay. I want to leave you with something, just uh, an inspirational, warm and fuzzy kind of feeling as we end our fourth episode of Art Matters, recorded live. I don't know how we'd record it any other way. At the Creamery <laughs> Art Center. <laughs> <clears throat> as he cracks his knuckles and he's getting ready to go. Thank you, Michael. Oh, yeah. You can lead a fish to water, but you better walk fast because he will die. Oh. I agree. Tam, <laughs> any more of these or if I have a serious talk? <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. <laughs> Brought to you by a class act productions.